You are listening to the Effective Statistician Podcast, a weekly podcast with Alexander Schacht and Benjamin Pieske designed to help you reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients without becoming overwhelmed by work. Today we are talking about design thinking. What's in it for statistician? A really interesting interview with Victoria. <music> Design thinking is really an interesting topic. It is showing up more and more in the publication, in the internet, and more and more people talk about it. And I actually found out about it on LinkedIn. And also on LinkedIn, I met Victoria the first time. And a little bit later, now she is on the podcast and has a really good discussion with me about this topic. So if you're not yet on LinkedIn, then I can really, really encourage you to be there because it's a really good place to build a network with other professionals. It's not like Facebook or these other uh, platforms where you got a lot of, you know, dancing people or uh, screaming cats or things like that. No, it's really good professional help for lots of the different things that we are talking about. And I'm sharing there a lot of things as well. So sign up for LinkedIn and follow me there. I'm producing this podcast in association with PSI, a community dedicated to leading and promoting the use of statistics within the healthcare industry for the benefit of patients. Join PSI today to further develop your statistical capabilities with access to the video-on-demand content library, free registration to the many, many, many PSI webinars, and much, much more. Visit the PSI website at psiweb.org to learn more about PSI activities and become a PSI member today. Welcome to another episode of the Effective Statistician Podcast. And this week, I'm very, very happy to talk with Victoria. And Victoria, we actually met on LinkedIn. So uh, if you are not yet uh, joining uh, the LinkedIn group of the Effective Statistician or not yet have connected with me, then please do that because there's a lot of things that uh, are discussed there and that are news that are shared there. And um, I'm also very often reposting things that other people in my network uh, are sharing. And through this kind of um, discussion, I learned about Victoria. But I better let her introduce herself. So, Victoria. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is really a very unique experience. I'm excited to be here. Uh, let me first start by saying um, that uh, the views that I'm going to share today um, and that are expressed by me in this podcast um, are my personal opinions and not those of Beringer Engelheim Pharmaceuticals, Inc. But with that, um, I am a statistician uh, by training, and I do work for Beringer Engelheim based out of our U.S. Uh, office. Uh, I lead a team right now uh, called uh, the U.S. Uh, Health Informatics and Analytics Team. And my role is focused on developing and leading uh, a team of experts who are working to optimize BI's clinical trial development utilization of um, and focused on harnessing the multidimensional real world data to help meet the needs of our patients through advanced analytics. And so uh, one of the areas that I love is this focus on real world evidence uh, which is quite innovative, and, and we're thinking about and applying it in different situations. So this concept of design thinking also is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I also have a passion for teaching and promoting statistics like you, so this is, a, a, again, a great opportunity. And I am also affiliated with uh, Columbia School of uh, Professional Studies, so uh, I teach there in their Applied Analytics program. I got my PhD in Biostatistics, um, and uh, have also a few degrees in mathematics that I've accumulated from Boston University along the way. But really, um, the team overall and the work that I do focuses on big data, machine learning, really thinking about other data sources that we use beyond, above and beyond clinical trial data. So we have a lot of experts in our company who focus on the clinical trial piece. And now we're starting to think more and more about how do we use other data sources, other types of algorithms. 
And so this is where we can apply some really cool new concepts and be innovative and think outside the box. That is really, really awesome. And it's really about this kind of interface between value statistics and data science and everything kind of blurs there together. And um, I, I love that because we shouldn't think of ourselves as, you know, we are clinical trial statisticians. You know, we are statisticians with a lot of knowledge about um, uh, methods and the business and the overall needs of the patients and whatever data helps us to um, move the treatment closer to the patient in any way we should leverage. And so um, I always thought that it's kind of weird to think of I'm a, don't know, real evidence statistician and I'm a clinical trial statistician and I'm a, don't know, whatsoever statistician. Um, very often kind of the, the language that we speak is, is the same. There's, of course, a couple of, let's say, um, different techniques, but even these blur together. Yeah? If you think about uh, proportional uh, propensity scoring, yeah, this kind of technique was very often uh, used in the past only for observational studies, and now it's so on vogue also for the estimate discussion. And uh, so a lot of uh, techniques can be used across, uh, across the board. And that's really a about understanding what do we want to achieve. And so the, the topic that we are talking about today is also something that um, we discussed about uh, in, in a LinkedIn post. And yeah, you agreed to, to talk a little bit about design thinking. Um, so for the listener, what is design thinking? Yeah, I, I think the topic of design thinking was very top of mind for me, especially under this global pandemic situation that we're currently in today. Um, it's around, um, so I, I would say that the world today we live in is a, a VUCA world, V-U-C-A, right? So you have the volatile, um, the uncertainty, the complexity, and the ambiguity. And it almost seems like a perfect storm for us to start applying some design thinking. Um, the problems that we tackle in our work in healthcare are very complicated. Uh, the, 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 the disease progression, the way that the disease um, you know, attacks the body, all of that um, is very complex. And so uh, the in order to make sense of how all of those things are interconnected, how all of that relates, we need to apply, from my perspective, this design thinking. So um, applying, to me, it's a, a set of principles that we can apply to our work. So it allows you to keep, for example, the human perspective in mind, the needs of people, the needs of our stakeholders, as we're trying to look at and address something that's new or different or maybe hasn't done before. Right? A lot of um, buzz is also around this topic of innovation and how do we innovate and, and come up with those uh, incremental and additional benefits. So I think... So in terms of the uh, stakeholders, then first you need to be aware of what are all the different stakeholders. Yeah, so, so that is the first thing that, that you need to have in mind that maybe... You're working just on a clinical study and you think of your stakeholder being the FDA. But in fact, there's a lot of further stakeholders beyond that that uh, are affected downstream in terms of you know, other regulators, the uh, payers, uh, needs of different people in, in the field, the treating physicians, the patients. All these need ha have further and other needs than, than maybe your primary stakeholder. Yes, this is a, a really great point. And I think that, you know, in our role, we may be able to address a part of the chain, but we are part of this greater and bigger picture. I think a, a term that relates to that is the systems thinking, thinking not just about the role that we play in maybe a more short-term perspective, but also the long-term. How is the system that we're part of really uh, being affected? And that's that whole value chain and all of those stakeholders and that stakeholder awareness is really important. I think as statisticians, it also 
brings to mind this patient centricity that is now a, a big focus, especially for our regulators. They're focused on the patients and all along. That's why I get up in the morning. That's why I do what I do because at the end of the day, we're all going to be patients. Um, And so really being able to afford them at all of that, the whole big picture is something important for us to have in mind, even though we might think that what we're solving is just a a portion of that problem. So we have to really adopt that um, design centric mindset and culture. Um, And it's, it's that, orienting um, concept of orienting our values towards solving complex problems when we think about um, the systems thinking, the big picture perspective, and then applying to that some strategic thinking and critical thinking are key. Yeah. And I, I think that is, that is really true because um, you could optimize a small part in the longer chain. And with that actually Makes the overall chain weaker. Yeah. So, so uh, just just an example. You could. Um, I was having some discussions about uh, uh, p values in a clinical trial recently, and the um, the proposal was to only uh, show the p values for the primary and gated secondary outcomes, and not for all the other analysis. And if you think of just you know, the FDA and maybe also the EMA, that may be completely fine. But of course, all this material is later on used also in all kinds of different settings for publications, for payer interactions, and all these kind of different things. And they may not agree in terms of this is for me the most important endpoint or the most important subgroup or whatsoever. And I want to see these pre-specified secondary analysis and um so therefore it's you know having this overall thinking in mind and this long-term view in mind you can see how if you would optimize just the deliverable for the fda you actually de-optimize the overall success uh, up to the patient yeah yeah that's a great example another one um, that comes to mind for me is Um, When we are doing um, some studies, uh, especially in the observational space, we might say that, you know, we have a limited sample size. And so what we want to do is just uh, present descriptive statistics on two groups. And uh, if you think about that, then what you're doing is just describing, right? You're trying to avoid um, doing any comparisons because it's not necessarily appropriate to do comparisons if you haven't, for example, randomized. But uh, at the end of the day, when people read, say, that publication that comes out in their heads, our nature is we will do the comparison. And so (laughs) it may actually be in that case better to then design for and uh, maybe, you know, use propensity scores or somehow otherwise adjust for the confounding, you know, state and do those comparisons, do some sensitivity analyses that will allow you to do that. So when people make the comparison, they have then the foundation on which to assess if it's an appropriate comparison or not. Yeah, completely agree. You see so often kind of these uh, slides at conferences where people put the efficacy of different compounds next to each other. Mm-hmm. And the decla- disclaimer beyond is, is these are different studies and shouldn't be compared. But of course, everybody compares. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> nice legal disclaimer that everybody kind of, you know, ignores that. Happens all the time. There was a great quotation that I read um, also around this design thinking concept uh, from Henry Ford uh, of uh, For- Ford Motor Vehicles that said um, um, it was also around, you know, uh, trying to get into the, the mind of the customer, or the stakeholder. And it said, if I asked um, what people wanted, they would say faster horses. Yep. So I think that that's the other piece of, um, you know, uh, we have to, as we're doing that uh, and planning that analysis and defining and contributing to um, defining the clinical objectives of the study, really thinking about the end in mind and what is it that is being asked when we do all of those analyses, post hoc analyses, many, many tables as we prepare for regulatory interactions, that's what we're doing. We're already doing a lot of this as statisticians, and it's really taking it to the next level. 
Yeah, I completely agree. It's kind of understanding that, you know, it's about getting faster from A to B and not about, you know, uh, having faster horses. And the same is true with, you know, if, you know, if your physician asks you to do lots of lots of subgroup analysis and you provide all these subgroup analysis, you know, table by table by table by table, you have fulfilled his request but he do still doesn't understand what the overall picture is, yeah, because it's spread around hundreds of pages. And that is exactly a very, very good principle. What are other principles in terms of design thinking that, that we should have, uh, have in mind? So I think um, in general, um, as I've read about this topic over the years, um, there are five uh, buckets, if you will, of design thinking. Um, in general, they relate to something around uh, empathi empathizing with others, so that human aspect of the design. And then there's the define stage, really defining, like you're saying, the problem, maybe it's defining the stakeholders, uh, ideating or innovating to really solve a problem, and then prototyping and problem solving, which all also relate to this um, um, uh a little aspect of problem solving and getting to the, the possible answer. I've also heard, um, again, there's a lot of overlap to me in, in terms of what we do as statisticians already, right? Understanding the stakeholder, be it your physician or medical colleague, be it the publications group that is working on the publication, thinking about who needs what, uh, thinking about then how do we frame that problem? And in that process, we're also doing a lot of collaborations. Uh, we're doing, a, a set, to an extent, some experimentation, right? Some of that happens at the designing stage. Some of that happens in the post-talk analysis or sensitivity analysis stage. And then um, some sort of visualization. You know, you mentioned those lots and lots of tables that we produce, right? But just because you build it doesn't mean that they will come. And so how do we actually think about, as statisticians, delivering also a story with that data. Um, you know, I think in pharma, we're very science-driven. We really focus on, um, we let the data do the talking, let the, you know, analytics do the talking. But we are also um, uh, owners of, of, of the product that we create. And so I think it is also our responsibility to take our stakeholder, our audience along on that journey. And that to me is a place where design thinking can be applied to consider, for example, even the patient perspective as you're doing that. We do lay summaries. Yeah. Right? That is a, a great example of something that is intended for um, a different stakeholder. Um, so those are, I think, a, a few of the elements. And I'd be happy to go into a little bit more detail on each, but those five areas that I think are the ones that come up over and over again. Yeah, let's double click a little bit more on the, on the human side of things, because I think that is really important. And just your uh, example with communication of data. Data usually, for non-statisticians, doesn't talk for themselves. I, th I think we commonly overestimate kind of what the overall understanding of data is and how people perceive data. I think we, it's maybe a little bit um, a trap of our function because we have worked with data for decades. And for us, it comes, you know, completely natural. Yeah, you, you, you see a chart and you directly get what it says. You see a table, you directly get what it says. Yeah, yes, you, you are, we are just so much trained to it that we think it's normal. Everybody yeah. has it. But that's not the truth. Yeah? Actually, mostly the opposite is true. And so um, I completely agree. It's kind of um, having this human factor in there that to make sure that people really get what you want. But also in terms of, you know, if you think about innovation, I would perceive there's also a lot of change management then basically needed, yeah? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I've met many people throughout my life who, when they ask, oh, what do you do? And I say, oh, I'm a statistician. 
Um, they, they, you know, either they're like, oh, that's interesting. You know, the reactions vary, of course, but to your point, not everyone really gets as excited about data as I do. <laughs> and so it's important from that perspective um, to, to really keep that in mind. And even though we have colleagues within our organizations that are also trained to understand data and are working with us and alongside us trying to help us to um, share what comes out of that data. We really know that data well. We know how it was designed. We know how it was collected. We know um, if there were any derived variables, how it was analyzed. And so it is up to us to, to help tell the story and to help really make sure that the key messages are very clear because there's also a challenge nowadays with the volume of data and the volume of information, right? And it's so um, easy to put a model into something and run it. I, you know, we've seen this explosion of data science, right? Yeah. Of, you know, there's a lot of data and a lot more needed to analyze it, but you have to understand the assumptions behind the different models and all of that. So to the extent that we can simplify and really focus the conversation, focus the output, focus what we put into the uh, clinical study um, reports really is going to be a huge benefit that that statistician who can um, simplify the message and make it very clear is going to really uh, have the opportunity to um, influence. And that's when you can really let the data and the science speak for itself. Yeah, yeah. If you put it in the right form and you know the right framing, in terms of framing, if you say framing, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's an, that article in um, the Harvard Business Review, and they had an example that I thought um, said it better than I could have. Uh, but they were talking about um, creating a customer journey map for the veterans in the Veterans Affairs um, Organization in the U.S. And uh, it allowed them to track um, the different um, high and lower points of the uh, interactions with the VA health system. And that created a, a better way for the organization to understand what does the patient or the veteran here experience along the way. So to me, this framing is really um, a refined understanding of the problem. And it's thinking about it from various different contexts along the way. Okay, okay, very good. Yeah, I, th I think that is really important because that gives meaning to the problem and that um, helps you to understand the different perspectives of the problem. Yeah, so, so that you have, okay, What is the perspective from the stakeholder? Why do they think about it? Why is that important? Why do we need so much detail here? Why we can ne neglect that part? Yeah, yeah. I think we also, I think, um, by nature, often jump to solutions and finding solutions and framing this problem to me is also reminding us to take a step back and first think about what is it that we're trying to solve? right? It's like the faster horses example that yeah. I mentioned a minute ago. Instead of trying to optimize the horses, try to think about and frame the problem. What is the actual problem that we're trying to solve? And we may need to have our horses go a little faster also, right? There yeah. may be an, a level of optimization in there, but it's also, I think, around helping us uh, refine the problem so that we can think about opportunities for innovation, about doing something a little bit differently. So, so if you are, for example, in a in a meeting with a physician, what tools or techniques could you use to go a little bit deeper? Yes, yeah, so is that you don't get, I oh, I need a p value here kind of uh, discussion, to, but but going deeper into that, what what approach would you do? So. Um This is a great question, and it's something that I encourage um, a lot of our colleagues to do, but it, it takes um, some time to practice, but it, it's about asking good questions. That is such a powerful tool uh, to really be able to um, be inquisitive and curious about what is it that they're trying to solve and what they're trying to um, get at. And so... Uh, I think that being able to, in that kind of situation and meeting with a physician, 
be able to try to understand what questions they're trying to answer. What are they really looking for? Uh, and to, you can do that through asking questions. People love to share what they know. People love to talk about themselves and, and what motivates them. And uh, I think that is also by asking great questions a way that we can build a good and trusting rapport with someone. The other um, second piece of advice I would offer is, you know, thinking about um, the extent that we can uh, tolerate the sort of prototyping concept. Mm -hmm. So maybe as you're sitting in those discussions, um, you can sketch something out, or maybe you come back to them in a week and say, you know, you, this is the question that you'd asked. Here's a table that I was thinking about. It doesn't have to be perfectly refined. You know, when you look at this table, what is the first place you would go to? Forget the numbers, right? Because we do tend to focus on that. Forget what the actual p-value is. What is it that they're trying to get out of that information? And in that way, if we can accept that kind of feedback, it's not about them saying, ah, you created a bad table. It's about them saying, you know, think about it and look at it in this way. And I think um, those are really key elements. Yeah, that's that's a good example, I think. we um, I've seen a lot of people that, you know, they get a question and then they work on the specification, they work with a programmer and they then first time share it back when it's all validated, all documentation signed off, and everything is kind of ready, just to find out mm, it's not completely what you know was needed. And then you know you go through the complete circle again. Yeah. And I think that doesn't speak for this prototyping approach. So um, I really love to have, you know these sketches and especially for visualization you can you know just use mm -hmm. pen and paper and you know sketch out a couple of concepts is that actually you know what you need what would be kind of and and then go in and have lots of lots of checks with the um with the other stakeholders being this, this you know internal or external physicians or maybe your regulatory scientist whoever yeah mm -hmm. um because that helps you to kill kind of bad projects very, very early and uh, also adjust along the line without wasting too much time. Yes, absolutely. And I think what we're seeing uh, more and more these days, you had mentioned visualizations, we're seeing data also being represented in different ways. Uh, we're seeing more um, statisticians within the pharmaceutical industry also looking now at R and building dashboards in R Shiny. And when I think about doing that, you know, one of the first steps there is then to do the wireframe, right? To sketch it out. Think about what would you do if you push this button? What would be the check or uncheck, the click or unclick that you would want to have? And so walking through that and having that more agile approach also, right? These All of these different frameworks really go alongside that concept of prototyping, getting that interim feedback and refining it before, like you're saying, before you have the final product available. Yeah, I think especially for uh, for these dashboards, um, my experience is you never get them perfect. You know, even when you roll them out in production, there's, there's imperfect. And there will be always version two, version three, version four, and things like that, because they are so complex and there's so many things that you can do with it. And, you know, once you load a different data set, you see that, you know, you need to be able to adjust for something different. Yeah. And so what I think is really good is if you kind of continuously uh, accumulate more and more feedback around it. Yeah. So that you, and there's a couple of different things I think that you can think about, for example, having, you know, in the system built in certain kind of tools that show you how the dashboard is used or it could be kind of surveys that you you know have with with users of the interface yeah whenever they close the interface they get a you know prompt to answer some questions things like that so that you can actually learn through the way okay what is working what's not working and uh, where are the different uh, improvements yeah. yeah, I mean, in our work, we have certain scenarios where we have to take that approach of, you know, this is the final validated table, and this is it, and this is full stop end product. But if you uh, apply what you just said, if you apply this mentality that 
we know there's going to be a second version. It actually, I've found, um, excites people. We can, and, and it allows you to simplify at the same time. So uh, if you have a project where you know that you're going to do something in order to make a decision of what to do afterwards, what to do next, where to take it as a next step, you can then say, okay, here for the, you know, the next few weeks on this dashboard, we want to build this specific functionality. And then what we want to do after that, you know, the more you know, the more you know, you don't know. So the next idea then becomes, well, we could also add this. We could look at it like this. Okay, put that into the next iteration. That's yet another value add. And it gives you also a chance to take the first version, run it through and get feedback from your stakeholders of and your users, how you're going to use it, and then further refine it and incorporate that. And I think that also knowing there's going to be a next version increases our comfort level of not having the first version have everything in it yeah. that we think. Yeah, yeah, it's, it speaks to this kind of minimal viable, viable product at the beginning. Yes. Uh, so, so it's not having, you know, something out there that, you know, meets don't know, maybe 80% of the requirements is better than to have, you know, something perfect three, three years down the line. Yeah, I think exactly. that, that's, uh, that's another problem. I know that um, I have worked on um, previous company I was working on, I worked on some table automations. Yeah, and my goal was to have kind of 80% of the standard tables covered with this macro. I think I had it all pretty much fleshed out. And, uh, but then there were all these kind of additional things coming in. Ah, shouldn't it be, you know, have an AE table for, um, crossover studies in it? And shouldn't it have, you know, this in it and this in it? And uh, how about, you know, the zeros so that should it show all the zeros or should it just show you know specific zeros in the table if you think about kind of if you have you know let's say lines by columns and there's you know uh, an empty line should that go away or should it be filled with zeros you can come up with all kind of crazy ideas when it's just about these simple tables i left then left the company and I think about five years later, I met my uh, prior supervisor and she said, you know what? The work that you have started has just been put in production. And I said, five years for a simple kind of descriptive macro, yeah? But this is, you know, that happens when you allow everything to go into it. And you want to, you know, kill everything with every bird with one stone. <laughs> you yeah. Never get well, shooting. Yeah. And and I think um, it goes back to where we started the conversation about this, you know, um, simplicity and, and the human uh, user perspective too, right? So, did the user need to, you know? have one versus two versus four decimal places and, you know, have the line here or there. If you think about some very um, uh, impactful products, uh, you also see, for example, uh, I think the, the article mentioned the Nest thermostat. There's not really many buttons on it. Yeah. It just sort of, you know, if you think about your phone, you, you know, it no longer has any buttons. You yeah. know, it's just... It, so, so the, the simplicity, um, I think, is a very key aspect of it. And also, um, starting with the why, as uh, in Simon Sinek's book, right. Right, if you get back to the why and the stakeholders and, and, and the, you know, who needs what, if you just do an initial iteration, again, you can always add more. Nothing's preventing you from doing that. Um, but we also have the caveat, of course, that in some of the work that we do, we can't be as, you know, innovative and as agile and as iterative, I would say. We can be innovative and agile, but maybe not as iterative. Yeah. Um, and so you have to also have a um, awareness of where such a design thinking approach can really be beneficial and impactful. In terms of that, is there a specific example that you have where, you know, design thinking had a really big impact for, for you or your team? So uh, definitely by working in this real world evidence space, um, we leverage a lot of new algorithms. So one of the things that uh, I encourage my team to do is to think about, you know, not uh, always getting the one perfect 
um, analytical approach, but maybe trying something. You can try, you know, random forest, but also a logistic regression with lasso. Um, and, and so there's different ways that you can look at it and then compare your models. And we do that, right? We, we have ways that we can compare the statistical models. When you think about feature engineering, right? You might have at first um, the ability to, if you have a data set that has many, many features, how do you, where do you start? You know, features if you wanted to covariates, co features, yeah. <laughs> features meaning covariates, exactly. If you look at some of these um, big data sources, you would think about a diagnosis code and a diagnosis code seems like a single um, construct, but in reality, a diagnosis code could be made up of 600 thousands of different diagnoses because that's what we're capturing in the real world along the lifespan of a, a person. And so just understanding a uh, patient's journey from the perspective of their diagnosis code is a mammoth problem. Not to mention then also thinking about, well, what medications might they be taking? What uh, are their healthcare interactions? Which doctors are they seeing? So again, the healthcare system, healthcare in general is a very complicated problem. But you have to start somewhere. And so that's been an approach that we've taken, definitely. Yeah, I, I think that is with these big data uh, analysis, if you think of, you know, big claims data and other kind of uh, health data sources, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of kind of missing in there, unclean data, unclear data. Uh, and so going in there with this mindset that, you know, you, if you would replicate the analysis, you would get for the tenth decimal the same analysis uh, results is really not maybe really sensible because and not, maybe also not needed because you know anyway the variation is is much bigger than that. Claims data sets get basically updated every second more or less. So uh, is it really needed that you get you know your overall patient number, you know, 100% correct. When you even tweak a little bit of an assumption, you add a couple of hundred or lose a couple of hundred patients in these maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of patients. So I think that's, uh, that also speaks to, to, to this approach. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's a, 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 a scenario where you, you really have to get clear on the, the question you're trying to address because there's so much that you could ask of the data, but you have to at some point focus and refine and simplify. Yeah. Yeah. So that is very, very good. In terms of your personal career, how has design thinking helped you progress on that? Design thinking, when I first started reading about it, uh, seemed to me to be very intuitive because by nature, I'm a researcher and I'm very curious. And so to me, design thinking really is about um, taking an inquisitive approach to the work and really looking at it um, as a set of questions and asking questions. Um, I once had a um, colleague um, probably it's probably a, a long time ago now, um, maybe five years ago, approach me in the hallway and say, um, you know, Victoria, I'd really like to work with your team on a, a machine learning project. And I was like, that, that is so great. What questions are we trying to address? And that really then set the dialogue and set the tone to really start thinking about, you know, there's so much that we could do. You could, it's so easy to push a button and do an analysis, but really thinking about what are the questions we're trying to answer for whom, what yep. the impact is. So um, it's really um, about, for me, leading from um, a place of developing and understanding of what others need. Um, and that creates also, I think, a stronger awareness, but also a stronger collaborative relationship to really uh, think through to, to be able to approach things from that inquisitive, curious perspective, because it comes from a place of helping, but yeah. also, you know, you can't do everything. So if you can really understand the core of what people need, what they're really asking for, and you have to do that by asking questions and showing them something and seeing what their reaction is. And that really, I think, helps to build um, those relationships. 
Yeah, yeah, I see. I can very, very much relate to that. Um, if I think back very, very early in my career, I was maybe just doing what I was being told, but I got a lot of better relationship and actually also much more fun and satisfaction at work when I started to ask more questions about what is really the need here. And then there was very often the opportunity to, you know, come up with something really innovative. Well, sometimes we just found out, actually, with this data, we can't answer the question. We're just yes. um, also, you know, valid outcome. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Very, very much uh, thankful for this interview. Is there one last point that you would like to uh, take our listener away from this conversation? Oh, my. So I, I guess to me, um, I think as statisticians, we have, we play such a critical role in the process of getting that medicine from start to end and getting it into the hands of every patient. And at some point, we're going to be those patients. So I really uh, think that putting ourselves in the shoes of our stakeholders and, and, and thinking about it from the patient perspective, from the you know, physician perspective that we're working with, from the perspective of the programmer that we're working with. So having that um, uh, empathy and looking at the problem we're trying to address from different perspectives, um, I think is, is a very important piece, being inquisitive about it like we just talked about. And I love the point you just made of, you know, also having some fun. We spend so much time doing this. It really is a lot of fun. And so um, it's great that we can have the opportunity to make an impact and we should enjoy it along the way. Thanks so much. Yeah. So we had a really, really great discussion now about uh, design thinking and how taking different perspectives um, the human perspective, the different stakeholders' perspective, how to work innovative. We talked about prototyping and, uh, you know, being agile there. Uh, we talk, had a couple of different case studies about where that especially makes sense in terms of, you know, table production or visualizations or big data sources. So we touched on a really, really lots of different topics. Thanks so much, Victoria, for this. And uh, for everybody listening, you can find more about Victoria on the Effective Statistician, uh, where we have a, a little bit of a um, short bio of her and also a link to her LinkedIn profile and also some references that we just talked about. Uh, for example, this HBR article. Thanks so much and talk to you next week. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Victoria and this interview was produced in association with PSI. Thanks to Rain who helps with the show in the background and thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please tell your colleagues about it. And if you want to find out more about Victoria and other episodes, head over to theeffectivestatistician.com where you can find the show notes and learn more about this podcast. And I'm pretty sure there will be further episodes that help you to boost your career as a statistician. If you have not done so, join LinkedIn, follow me there, and also join the Effective Statistician uh, LinkedIn group. Reach your potential, lead great science, and serve patients. Just be an effective statistician.